um, a really good book. And we've had many book studies over the years. Again, it's just been a few years since we did it. And, and I think that you would agree, uh, just reading the first chapter uh, is enabling us to understand some things perhaps we didn't but, and the introduction, of course. So welcome, really happy to be together. Uh, next week, we won't be in this room. And after this week, I'll tell you, at, at the end of this class, I'll tell you where we're going to be. <laughs> it depends how many show up. It, it, it'll either be, I don't know, you well know I don't like to do anything that's not very holy in church. Uh, but be, be the vacation Bible school is going to be here this coming week. And the John Paul II, if enough, if enough people come tonight, we won't be able to head into John Paul II. But we're going to count everybody. You will be. <laughs> and uh, we'll tell you it's going to be the church of the morning, too. At the end of this class, we'll pick up your study questions at, at that table right there. So that'll be for next week, okay? For the study questions. And then next chapter is a lot more intensive. The second chapter, a lot more to cover next week. So it's going to take you longer to read um, the next chapter, chapter two, than it would have taken you to read the introduction and the first chapter of this week. So give yourself some extra time. I was reading it between yesterday and today, but this thing ever ran. <laughs> and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not, never had been a big reader. Uh, I, I had the first book I ever read is um, in, on the coffee table in, in my part of the rectory, and it's a pippy long stock in seven seats. <laughs> and my handwriting has not gotten any better. I have my name on the book, on the front of the book, and it marks a lot. Uh, but I've never been a really big reader. Uh, I began to read, really read, in college seminary because we had some great courses, and uh, it was expected that we read, but then I, I began to enjoy reading. In high school, you know, they tell you what to do all the time. <laughs> College Seminary had some great courses uh, that I just enjoyed reading things for. And of course, in theology, I read about, I went to school in Rome, so I read about uh, pasta, and I read about wine. <laughs> 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 and also, anyway, they kind of like, you know, that was really intensive. Um, but uh, so I'm not a huge reader. Uh, I don't find a lot of time to read uh, as a priest in the parish. Um, so it's really good for me to be with y'all reading this book. And a number of people here in this room uh, were the ones who uh, suggested this book. And um, the, pre the, the uh, layman, uh, Dr. Petrie, his parents are in, the, are in one of my very best friend's parish. So he's right there from home, Louisiana. Or Bayou Blue, which is a little part of home. So uh, we're real glad to be together. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Father, we thank you that you bring us together. We thank you for the opportunity to study and to come to know your son Jesus and hopefully love him more by our study of him. Uh, help us to be guided by the inspiration of your spirit so that what we learn here will put into practice by practicing our holy Catholic faith. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have no idea why I'm being taped right now. The boss said to he, he wants it done. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> because I only want to say a few things to y'all that I don't want out there. <laughs> That's the way I feel about things, to be honest with you. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But thanks, John, for doing that. I really appreciate it. Whatever that's being done for, I appreciate it. We had one lady who's moved to, um, who's moved away. She and her husband, a big part of our parish. <laughs> he was a golfing friend of mine in the parish when I played golf. And the best thing that Rich did was, Rich Perkins, our seminary, was take my clubs away this summer, and I shall never get them back, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but he was my good, good golfing friends, and, and uh, uh, great guy. And uh, he and his wife had to move to be close to the family because they're not very well. But she, she said, never stop sending that mass, that we do this you know, five o'clock mass on Saturday evening is, is I don't know what they call it, taped. It's not taped, it's recorded. Video and it's sent and then it's put out in forms and fashions that I don't understand. Facebook, which I don't use, and um, and YouTube, which I do use. But anyway, uh, the lady said, "Please don't stop doing that." So that was that was that was a good thing. We don't want to, we don't want people to stay at home and, and, and never go to mass. That's basically what we certainly don't want because we would be able to partake of what we, we're going to talk about here for the next eight weeks. 
So we're the largest crowd we'll ever be, because we have 79, and by the end of eight weeks, there'll be about seven of you left. So who, who will it be? I mean, who will it be? I want to know which of the seven of you are going to stick in there. It'll be interesting to find out. Um, you know, when I was a kid, the, the, the most famous of the shows about Jesus was Jesus of Nazareth. And you might call it, I think Zeffirelli was the one who, who directed that. And Jesus had piercing blue eyes, like white people would need you to believe. <laughs> you white East, uh -uh. he looked like me, then he looked like you. No piercing blue eyes for Jesus. But anyway, um, the reason I mention that is because I, I think that there's something, um, when we watch a show like Jesus of Nazareth, or um, more recently, uh, The Passion of the Christ, it sort of puts meat on the bones of the Lord's life. Uh, and, and, and my first impression uh, of reading of the, the introduction and the first chapter is that uh, what Dr. Petrie is expecting us to do, or perhaps one of the, uh, um, one of the uh, objectives of his book, is to help us to understand our blessed Lord's Jewish roots. In other words, that he's actually a Jew. And that's why I do recommend some, certain other books uh, there's a lady that was a soul, Anne Rice, who wrote Dracula movies until she came back to the Catholic, Catholic, Catholic Church. She wrote Dra Dracula books, and she wrote two books when she came back to the Catholic Church um, on, on the life of Christ, which again, put meat on the bones. They're not historical works at all, they're just fiction altogether. But nonetheless, when we watch those kinds of movies, read this kind of book, of course this is a, a book of, of reflection and theology, uh, but nonetheless, it's important for us to understand the humanity of our Savior and his upbringing, his roots, his Jewish roots in particular, to help us understand, and the chapter two is even better for this, to help us understand what he's trying to get at, what, what, from whence he's teaching, right? But people say to me all the time, we love when you talk about your mother, right? I mean, some of you probably are sick of it by now. <laughs> Father Rogers is really funny. So he, I have a homily service, by the way. Six or eight priests are giving the same homily I'm giving on Sunday, except I'm giving it to them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Father Rogers says, um, we can do I have a nuge, which is a nugget, which means to have something to start the homily with, like a little catch, like, you know, uh, like I come up with, try to come up with an image. And he says, could I have your nuge, which means your nugget, your you're starting, how are you going to start? So, and he said, I don't want to hear anything about your mom. <laughs> but that doesn't help me at all. Because <laughs> his mother, his mother's sister, his godmother's in Paris, so he can't make up stories about my mom <laughs> in his parish. But the point is, is that you know, it humanizes the person that's preaching. It humanizes them. And it comes in, in other words, there's a historical context there. Oh, we know who you are because we know a little bit about your family. So I, I mention that to you only because um, I think this book assists to put meat on the bones of our Lord's life um, all, all together, in fact. All right, uh, the first thing uh, at first is he tells us how he came to be, um, how he came to be doing what he's doing, this, this layman. Oh, by the way, uh, Dr. Petrie, uh, whom I do not know and may never actually meet, uh, is a professor of theology at uh, Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans, not to be confused with Notre Dame, uh, University of Notre Dame in Indiana, but Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans, and uh, he's a professor, so that's what he does. I don't know what else he does, but I do know he does that. But um, I did appreciate um, that uh, he had uh, that experience, as you might recall from your reading, uh, about um, he, had a, he, he was fully expecting um, his non-Catholic wife's pastor, his, his ex, his non-Catholic wife's pastor, who was not the pastor whom she grew up with, her grandfather started the church, to be very receptive to uh, them being married at that church, but he, he met the very opposite thing, didn't he? Yeah. And, I, and I, I have this guy that's after me, he's just, he's a, he's a park stalker, and you see, I walk in the middle of the park, and uh, he's a park stalker at this point. Because he, he, by chance, I guess, met me on Ash Wednesday, and now I've come to find out more about him. He's, a, he's Jehovah's Witness. 
Oh, he hasn't said that, but I know he is. <laughs> I'm not, not against anybody. We never denigrate Christians. We never denigrate people of any faith in our parish, ever. It's like, because we're on the same team with all Christians. Nonetheless, on Ash Wednesday, I got out real late to walk really like, I'm in there at the park at 7, I walk her at 7, every morning at 7. It's like a deal. She's like, it's 7. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm walking to like at 8, after some mass was at 7.30, so I got to the park at 8.30, and this guy just happened to, like, you want to talk to him. It turns out he spent almost two hours really hammering me, you know, about all this stuff. Then he's got me a couple of times, if not three more times in the park, yesterday being one of them. And, uh, and so the point being, uh, in, in, the, in the park, there is no proselytizing that much. And we walk our dogs, and that's about it. Except one lady did, precious lady, I've come to know her since then, she said, um, he gets really pretty dog. This is about seven years ago. He wrote pretty dog. I said, of course I have a pretty dog. Thank you for coming. So she said, yeah. So we began to talk. She said, would you like to join me at First Baptist this morning? <laughs> I said, I would love to, but I'm the priest. I'm the priest of Paul. Like, oh so she stopped after that. This guy, this guy is still on it. I mean, he's still on it. He's, still, he's in his fourth go-round. And like yesterday, I began to, I, I did not shut this guy down at all. You know, I was like, just trying to listen to what he has to say about his faith. So, but I sort of am guiding him a little bit too, although he doesn't really know it. But the point is that, you know, um, the, the point I really want to make is that um, Foley is a perfect example of people, of, of followers of Christ living in peace with each other. Um, I, when I got really sick a couple of years ago at this time, uh, actually uh, two years ago in July, I got back to the park and man, People started singing to me. A beautiful lady just wrote a song about me. And I was like, she said, you sit down. Said, you got to hear the song wrote about you. And there's all these people. And I, the first lady I saw screamed, God has healed you. And she's, she came to RCIA, this lady. And she said, after she, she didn't come become Catholic, but she, um, she said, um, she, about a year later, she said, that she found the church. She never knew Jesus Christ, this woman. And one of our ladies brought her to RCIA, which she did not complete because she did feel called to be Catholic. So um, anyway, um, she said, are you upset with me I didn't become Catholic? I said, of course not I'm upset with you to become Catholic, because I just, it just wasn't for me. But now she's, oh, she loves the Lord. I mean, her whole heart is for the Lord. And she uh, loves her dog, too. But she's just screaming across, across, the Lord has healed you. I mean, real loud. <laughs> the Lord has healed you. And so I mean, what I'm trying to say is the reception that this young man and his fiancée that received from the pastor was most regrettable, uh, most regrettable, uh, because of, we, we have to build each other up in the body of Christ. Uh, I'm not suggesting that all faiths are the same, obviously. I believe the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ, and it's the only church that can say that about As Siri. I mean, as Siri. I mean, she's smart. I mean, yeah, seriously, as Siri. I'm going to talk to this girl from the home and say, Siri, who started the Catholic Church? It says Jesus Christ. So it's not like we're all, I'm, I'm not saying that all places are the same. What I'm saying, however, is we're on the same team in this world that's become highly secular. And so we don't spend any time denigrating or putting anybody down who believes in Jesus. Nonetheless, I think all of the things we go through in life enable us to draw closer to Christ if we allow it. And that's exactly what he said. And that's so the first question I asked y'all um, to answer was, in fact, when was the second time uh, Dr. Petrie's eyes were filled with tears? Can you answer that question? When you read, opened the book, opened the Bible, and said, if you eat my twice. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I was elated, he says on page six. I was elated that Jesus himself had said that his flesh and blood were real food and real drink, which he had commanded his disciples to receive that they might have eternal life. And it was then, uh, of course, that his heart uh, was filled with tears for the second time. And the first time was when the, the pastor was like, <laughs> <laughs> That was the first time he started crying. <laughs> The second time was when, when he realized you know, what he had always believed as a Catholic, that when we receive Holy Communion, we receive the body and blood of Christ. 
as we said, the body, blood, soul, and divinity, divinity of Christ was in fact his childhood faith was true. Because as you might recall, and this this is I don't know if this has ever happened to me, it might have happened to y'all, but he decided to, to read that Bible that night to figure out if his if his childhood faith was true. And he opens up the Bible, and what was it? John chapter 6. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. It's like, okay. Somebody's trying to talk here. And so that, that was why his, his eyes uh, were filled with tears for the first time. Or second time, pardon me. Uh, the second question in the introduction is, what encounter was the impetus uh, for uh, Dr. Petrie to become a biblical scholar? That same encounter, right? In many ways, it was one of the reasons today says in the middle of chapter 7. In many ways, it was one of the reasons today that I'm a biblical scholar and spend my days and nights studying, teaching, writing about the Bible. And so again, uh, I think you probably learned in your life that those things which seem at first to be uh, crosses only become the greatest blessings at times of our entire lives. And that's certainly has been the case with him. Uh, the third question I asked you from the introduction. In order to understand who Jesus, pardon me, in order to understand who and what, in order to understand Jesus, who and what must we understand first? This is found, uh, who, can, who would like to take an opportunity to answer that? Anyone? Yes, Sorry, Mary. Right, exactly. G bottom, of page, thank you, Mary. bottom of page eight. Jesus had, Jesus had to have made sense in his own context. Very important. And his context is that of Judea and Galilee. Jesus cannot be fully understood unless he is understood through the first century Jewish eyes and heard through first century Jewish ears. Now, I will say this, and I've told you all this before, uh, and sometimes, to be honest with you, uh, I, I may not have been, I said this in some mass, but I, have, I did have a chance to travel while I was a student in Rome all over Europe, and I only had really traveled in Europe, I hadn't traveled in Rome. I would do go to Africa because we went to the Holy Land, and we went to Egypt nonetheless. The only worthwhile trip I've ever taken in my life was to the Holy Land. Otherwise, it was wonderful. It was a, it was a, it was glorious. It was fabulous. It was Rome for five years. It was all that, but to get to see where our Savior lived and breathed and walked and taught and worked miracles. That was transformative for me. There, there are certain times when, um, when I'm preparing to preach or just reading the scripture of my own that I, I just remember where I was on the certain days that I was in the Holy Land for like two weeks, whatever the case may be. So that's, that understanding of context is so very, very important. All right, we any questions so far or comments? Because I don't mean to hog this whole deal. If there are questions or comments throughout this, what I found in RCIA, and we get, we get together for RCIA um, you know, in, in, in November or December, is, um, and I've done private instruction for people to become Catholic, um, and I've done that dozens of times because you know they come in May again. Uh, at, like we just had Easter, can I become Catholic? Uh, yeah, you gotta wait till next Easter. <laughs> 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 this guy's <is> strict. <laughs> but no, I, I just, you know, in that case, obviously, I don't wanna make them wait, or for some circumstance, I, I've just brought dozens of people into the church through what I call private instruction. Really, it's just meeting people one on one. But the RCIA process, uh, when people are together on Wednesday evening, is much more beneficial because you have somebody that's gonna ask a question that I've never thought to explain, or another person's never thought to ask. So feel free to pipe up uh, and uh, and offer a reflection. So I'm going to give you a comment. Just a comment that yes. I think a lot of us have gone through all our lives. You yes. can't get engaged in conversation with somebody else as a different faith, and they come on so authority yeah. that they put you on the defense. Yeah. And sometimes they make you feel uncomfortable because you start doubting. Well, no, I know that. You well, know, this guy's done that in the park with me three or four times. Now. I mean, yeah. he's saying things that I've just, you know, it's like this song that he says, you know, the earth will become your. Well, like, well, again, yeah, I mean, how do you explain eternity to someone who doesn't really seem to believe in eternity yet? 
Yes, so the barber's point was sometimes people of other faiths. Now, this was the case, we're becoming less Christian in America. We're becoming less believers in God. So there are fewer and fewer people who are willing to take somebody on like this. And that's an unfortunate situation in some ways. Uh, but the point is, is that, and, and that's one of the things I mentioned to you only because we, we are missioned, as you know, to go and proclaim the good news to people. But uh, one of the things I will say about the man in the park who's trying so desperately to convert me, well, he has no idea, there's no way, there's no way in H double mastics. <laughs> my people were Catholic since James, who was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Who went to Lebanon and preached the good news? So this is a twenty. This is like twenty-one centuries for this guy. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Tell oh, once you were converted, yes. the Eucharist been the biggest single issue. Uh, it's funny you should say that. Tim's question is: Are is the Eucharist the single most difficult? Difficult, maybe, Tim? Is that what you're thinking? Or sometimes the issue, the Eucharist becomes the most positive thing for them. Sometimes the Eucharist is really the only thing they want to become Catholic for because they're married to a Catholic and they can't receive Holy Communion. And I'm not saying that it becomes a, it becomes like a token, as it were, but it does become an impetus for them to want to know about the Catholic faith. So that's one thing I would say about the Eucharist relative to people who want to become Catholic. The second thing is that sometimes the Eucharist becomes a, um, the thing that really hooks them into the Catholic faith. Then in other words, you go, this is so positively awesome that I can't help but want to become Catholic. Having said that, there was a kid who became a kid, pardon me, he's a young man. Um, everyone becomes kids at a certain point. So there's a young man who became Catholic, and I, I'll tell you, I had quite a walk with him, uh, because until the very end, he just, he was really struggling to understand the Eucharist. So we have a wonderful, we have several wonderful priests in the Archdiocese, uh, but among the most wonderful is Father Dean, who is a, you might, some of you might remember as the pastor in Alberta for about three years at St. Bartholomew. And Father, Father Dean is a, a wonderful priest, a very devout priest, a very, very good priest. And I know he's a good priest. I'm, not all priests are very good priests. <laughs> They're not, we're not all in the same category. Father Dean's um, got the zeal of a young man He's two years ahead of the ordination. But he's also got at his fingertips, he had the blessing of growing up in Montgomery, Alabama. And I had the blessing of growing up in Mobile, Alabama, where I didn't know there was not a Catholic. I just thought everybody was Catholic. Because, I mean, the whole world is Catholic in Mobile, Alabama. And so I, I never had to explain my faith to anybody. I mean, like somebody would ask me a question about faith, I'd say, are you stupid? <laughs> I was asked the question like, you dumb bell? Like, oh, well, you're not Catholic. Well, why are you living here anyway? <laughs> anyway, uh, I never had to explain my faith. Paul Dean, on the other hand, grew up in Montgomery, where you know, Catholics are a fraction of the population. So he, had, he grew up explaining his faith to everybody. So Father Dean truly, and he has everything on his computer. So, I said to Father, I said to this young man, I said, I'm going to put you in touch with the priest, because I did my very best over seven months and, and prior times with him too, to explain the Holy Faith to him, and it just wasn't enough. So I said, Father Dean is the man you need to talk to. And uh, Father Dean sent me several articles, and, uh, and it wasn't any time that, <laughs> so funny, his fiance told me yesterday, they get married in the church here next month, this month, later next week said, well, he went to daily mass today. He said, he's the guy that wasn't going to become Catholic. <laughs> he has plans to go to daily mass today, which would be the second. And he's going to go every day. He works in Gulf Shores to our lady in the Gulf. So, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's Hispanic, it's, in the Spanish, you say, es la hora de Dios. It's the work of God. Amen. It's Amen. the work of God. So, um, I'd say that the Eucharist is many things for people who have been very, um, it, become, it, it, was, it was a stumbling block for this young man to the very end. Truly, thank you for asking that great question. What else, what other questions, comments, anything? Thank you, Father, too. All right, very good. All right, uh, the ministry, first chapter, the mystery of the Last Supper. All right, the mystery of the Last Supper. 
Um, the first question I asked you to focus on was, what must we focus on in order to explore the humanity of Jesus? Who would, who would like to offer that answer if you're, if, from the reading? Yes, Joseph. Right, his Jewish identity, which is very much uh, the same answer as uh, uh, Mary pointed out. Uh, you have to understand, uh, middle of page 12, much of the effort has gone into exploring the question of the divine identity. In other words, to prove that Jesus is divine. On the other hand, what Dr. Beecher is saying, however, for anyone interested in exploring the humanity of Jesus, especially the original meaning of his words and actions, a focus must be on the I Jewish identity that is absolutely necessary. Again, understanding uh, Jesus' ancient Jewish context. Furthermore, it says uh, Jesus, was, Jesus uh, was a Jew, sent to Jews. He, he was taught about the Jewish faith. In other words, the, the, uh, that, this means, again, a little bit later, this means that virtually all of Jesus' teachings were directed to a Jewish audience in a Jewish setting. Now, that's important. Why is that important? Because we're reading the Gospels of Jesus Christ. And who were his original hearers? Jewish people. Right? So it's really important to come to understand that Jewish identity uh, for us to understand our blessed Savior. So... Um, I'm just going to write that on the board, his Jewish identity. His Jewish identity. In fact, I've learned so much. Uh, this next chapter is really good. So, so a few of you may quit if I keep talking about how good chapter two is. <laughs> okay, so his Jewish identity. And then the question then becomes, uh, uh, how did Jesus announce to his own people his identity as Messiah? Who would venture to answer that question? Yes, Liz. Where, where do you find it? At the bottom of page 2, when it says today, after reading Isaiah, it says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Exactly. So Jesus himself reveals his Jewish identity when he opens the book of the prophet Isaiah to begin his public ministry. And the first thing he says is, today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> Jesus announced who he is in a Jewish way. Okay. Right. You should not drink the blood. All right, so that brings us to the third question, which may uh, help us to understand why, uh, and Tim's question, what are the objections that people have even in our day? Uh, because there were certainly people who had objections in our Lord's day uh, relative to uh, what are the three reasons people disagree on the meaning of Jesus' words, this is my body. If you will, please uh, look at the bottom of page 14. There are three reasons. The reasons for disagreement are several. First of all, it is the shocking nature of Jesus' words. How can anyone, even the Messiah, command his followers to eat his flesh and drink his blood? And this says, top of page uh, 15, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Oh gosh, this is one of my favorite things. Chapter 6, verse 66. And what's the line there? And many left him and no longer walked with him. That's chapter 6, verse 66. Isn't that interesting? And God's prophet is 666. They no longer walked with Jesus. That's the first one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that's what you, the devil always attempts us to do. He's turned away from Jesus. He's winning victories in this country 1% of the time. You realize that? 1% of Americans every year cease to believe in God all the time. In 20 years, in 20 years, the last 20 years, 20% 20 of Americans, 1% a year on average, have ceased to believe in God altogether. And they no longer walk with Him. Huh? Okay. I would like just for a moment, if you will, and, I, and this is not a Bible study, but I will tell you a little inspiration that 
I had a, a, we have scripture study in Spanish on a Friday evening, and uh, I don't lead it. Uh, it's it's a wonderful young man. We yeah, it, it's good folks that lead it. But anyway, um, we had a young man in the area who left to go learn how to be a missionary, and he came back to share his experience. He went. He's from Mexico, but he, he went to California to join a. It's kind of a religious order. It is a religious order. Um, and he learned that this process of learning how to be a missionary to teach the word of God, the, the, the scriptures. Okay. And so he came back and said, I said, well, Miguel, would you like to share your story you know, a little bit? So he said, sure, I'd be happy to. So he went on one Friday evening, uh, the scripture said, not this Friday, but Friday before that. And, uh, and he, he said, okay, let's, let's start with Psalm, I forget what Psalm, Psalm 4 or Psalm 2 or Psalm 1. And boy, they all plopped open their Bibles and said, are these people Catholic? <laughs> they all just Bible ready to be open, you know? But um, the reason I mention that to you is I've, I've had my Bible with me, and that's not the, that, that important. But John chapter 6 is what uh, the first reason people stopped following Jesus is that these were shocking words. I mentioned John chapter 6 because oftentimes... John chapter 6, oftentimes it's been called the Constitution, Constitution on the Holy Eucharist, on the Holy Eucharist. And by Constitution, we mean founding document. I mean, our nation is guided by the founding document of the Constitution. And so the founding document of, of, the, of the Holy Eucharist Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. And then he says, the man who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Okay. But John chapter 6 begins with our Lord, for one occasion, multiplying, multiply, multiple, multiplication of the loaves and fish, right? Of the loaves and fish. And in, in, um, in, do you remember there were leftovers? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm not going to ask for the show of hands, but I'm not going to ask for the show of hands, but who likes leftovers? I mean, I love leftovers. Yeah. <laughs> I was raised by a man who ate leftovers. I was raised by a man who, if it didn't run around by itself in the fridge, it would get eaten. So before I went to retreat, I had cooked a bunch of stuff, and, and I put it in the fridge, and I never can eat it because I don't have time to eat it. You know, you're going around some other place you're doing it. So I said, I'm going to clear out my fridge. So the morning of retreat, I cleared out my fridge, and I paid for it. <laughs> I got sick, actually. And I'm not sure if it was what I ate or did I get tired to come home from retreats after, because I had fever. It wasn't COVID. Uh, not everything is COVID, you know. I said the COVID's not, the COVID's bad, but it wasn't COVID. But anyway, I got a fever and had to come back home. But nonetheless, uh, there, in, in this particular miracle, there Jesus, our dear Lord, multiplies bread and fish twice in his ministry. Okay. In this particular, um, in John's version of this particular miracle, there are 12 wicker baskets full. 12 baskets. And I mention that to you only because how many apostles are there? 12. 12. And so there's every indication that John was pointing out that these 12 wicker baskets one was to be taken by each one of the apostles who were then to go and bring that good news and that Eucharist to some part of the world. Because the word apostle means what? Apostolate in Greek means as one sent, as opposed to disciple, which means what? One follow, one who follows. Okay, so the disciples are the followers, the apostles are the ones sent. Right? So the miracle is, uh, John chapter 6 begins with Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish. Then our dear Lord walks on water. Walks on water. Okay, nobody's done that since our Lord said the Bear Bryant. But anyways. <laughs> you notice I didn't mention the present coach, but anyway. Um, so our dear Lord walks on water to the other side of the lake, but the people beat him to the other side of the lake. 
and then they begin to ask him for more food. And our Lord says, I will give you a food that when you eat it, you will no longer hunger. Okay? Keep in mind that the, the Lord's time was a sustenance lifestyle. The, of course, we're going to refrigerators and freezers. But people did not have an abundance of food. So people were often hungry. So when you say, I mean, we're not hungry. I mean, I know the food's gone up sky high in price. But nonetheless, we're not hungry. None of us is hungry. But and we're very fortunate to live in a time where we're not actually living in a sustenance economy. We're living in a, a, a plentiful economy. Not all over the world, but we have a lot. Even poor people in our country have more than maybe rich people in other parts of the world. So they say, Lord, would you give us food? He says, I will give you food that when you eat it, you will no longer hungry. Give us this food always. It is my flesh that I will give you, my flesh for the life of the world. He says, and then he begins to teach, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Now, if you'll notice, the word multiplication comes from multitude. Because the scriptures in John chapter 6 say, a multitude was following Jesus. Multitude, right? When Jesus at the end says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. They all ceased following Jesus. In fact, John chapter 6, verse 66, 666, and they no longer followed Jesus. The next line out of our Lord's mouth was this. To the 12 apostles, he said, will you leave me too? And the Lord said, and who speaks? Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What are the words of eternal life? Unless you, when you eat the flesh of the, and of the Son of Man, and when you drink his blood, you have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Those are the words of eternal life. You shall no longer die, but even if you die, you will live forever. Okay? So those are the words of eternal life. Then Saint, then our dear Lord answers Saint Peter. Pardon me. He says, oh, no, he says, uh, Saint Peter says, we have, we believe. I'm taking a little detour off the chapter because we have a little time. Next week we're going to be more specific about the book. This is a lot more to cover. But we only have a little bit left to cover in this chapter. St. Peter says, we believe and have come to understand. So my advice to the young man that I referenced before, I said, there are some things, and I wasn't, and I, I, I tell them, I'm not trying to make you Catholic. I, that is not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to make you Catholic. I will explain my faith to you, but I will not try to make you Catholic. And I told him, I said, but there are some things, particularly about our faith, that you have to place your belief in in order to understand. So the, 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 the belief comes before the understanding. And that's why this kid, young man, is going to Mass every day now. <laughs> <laughs> because he has come to, he's placed his, he's believing He's believed in. And in believing, in believing, he's come to understand. He's understanding. So believing comes first and then understanding it. It's all the same for us, isn't it? When we put our belief in God, there's so much more than that, that happens. Does that belief come from God? Yes. Thank you for asking that, Joe. Joe was my first, I gotta tell you, Joe was my <laughs> first student ever that I taught about the Catholic faith. He was, uh, how old were you, uh, how old were you 29 no, years ago? No. 29 years ago. 30 years ago, how old were you? Yeah, 44 now. Okay, so you were, uh, yeah, so, okay, you were, so anyway, you were, you were 14 years old, and his daddy pulled up the truck at Our Lady of Golf, and he said, I want these kids to receive their Holy Communion, and I taught Joseph and his sister, and brought them in, uh, gave you your, your first, did I do the first Holy Communion, or Father Zaki did? Father Zaki. Okay, so Father Zaki got well enough to come back, yeah. So the Father, but I remember sitting in the, uh, in the, in the den, Father Zaki's area, life was his stage, and he didn't know Father Zaki. Life was his stage, and uh, so anyway, the question, Joseph, is that's true, yes. Is it, so there are three what are called, there are three what are called theological virtues. Okay, so prudence is a human virtue. Courage is a human virtue. Um, 
courage, like I'm chicken of um, I'm chicken of the MRI. You know, chicken. So I had to be tested when I came back from retreat. I'm going to make sure I didn't have anything that I could get to y'all. So I went and got tested for all sorts of things. So they did a uh, they did a scan, and I had to go in this thing. I was like, I can do this. Open your eyes. Just open your eyes. So you can you can actually buy habits. You can become courage. Um, temperance is a virtue. Temperance. In other words, I'm not. My father was never tight. Never drank more than two beers. He drank two beers, but he never drank three beers. Now you can't get drunk on two beers. So my father was never drunk, ever. My mother told me, ever. And they were together their whole lives. She said your father was never tight. So my father taught himself that. Taught me he drank a mixed drink like once a year. What, you drank a couple of mixed drinks. You're up you're there. Take it from a guy who's had a couple of mixed drinks. So, um, but you can be you can teach yourself temperance. You can discipline your body to be temperate. So courage, temperance, prudence. I can see the future. In other words, by, by, I can be prudent enough to say, you know, um, uh, I'm going to um, I'm not going to drive 120 miles an hour because I realize that's dangerous for myself and others. So I'm prudent. But there are certain virtues called theological virtues, which theos comes from the word Greek God. Theological virtues are faith, hope, and love. Charity. Or charity. Thank you. Charity is a word for love. Yeah. So you cannot, you cannot fabricate faith. It's a gift. It's a gift given by God to us. So, yes, it is. Now, that gift is given by God to us, but generally God uses other people to bestow that gift upon us. Now, of course, the gift of faith is first given in baptism in the sense that the child is endowed with the Holy Spirit when he or she is baptized. Nonetheless, this, that faith is kept in safekeeping by people of faith. So you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here had we not been brought up by people of faith or brought to the church by people of faith or had our faith confirmed. Exactly. Uh, I always think when I pray at Mass several times a week for we pray in Thanksgiving for our faith and those who gave us the faith. So uh, the, the gift given by God is kept in safekeeping which is why you say you're getting your stinking little butt out of here. Bed, we're going to church. You got to get all that brood out of bed. You know what I'm saying? You say you're going to church because part of part of being a parent or someone who loves children is to make sure that he or she is brought up in the faith. So thank you. That is a great question. Faith is a virtue given by God alone. It's not something we can fabricate. Thanks. Great question. Okay. The second reason um, why. Uh, people found it difficult or disagreed on the meaning of our Lord Jesus' words. Uh, middle of page 15. Another reason for disagreement is somewhat more subtle. Even if Jesus was speaking literally about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, what could such a command even mean? Was he talking about cannibalism, eating the flesh of a human corpse? Well, there is no explicit commandment against cannibalism in the Jewish Bible. It was certainly considered taboo. Again, the Gospels bear witness to this reaction. The Jews disputed uh, among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Okay. So it's a little bit of a continuation of the first disagreement or the first um, objection to our blessed Savior's uh, words. And the third, perhaps the strongest objection to the words come from the Jewish scriptures itself as any ancient Jew would have known, the Bible absolutely forbids a Jewish person uh, to drink the blood of an animal. Although many Gentile religions considered drinking blood to be a perfectly acceptable part of pagan worship, the law of Moses specifically prohibited it. God has made this very clear on several different occasions. Take, for example, uh, in these words from Genesis. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So, uh, for, the, um, for the Jewish mentality, or the Jewish person, him or herself, uh, the drinking of blood by, uh, from another, 
uh, human uh, from an animal would certainly uh, be forbidden. Uh, please turn to page, page 16. Middle of the page. Clearly the commandment against drinking animal blood was serious. To break it would be mean to be cut off. It was a universal law. Um, so uh, that's because, of course, if you ate, if you drank animal's blood, you were drinking his or her life, which means, of course, you were, we were the supreme beings of God. Let's just talk about that, why, in fact, that, um, um, we know this. By the way, yesterday we had blood drive. Um, it's pretty awesome. Uh, there were people here all day long giving blood. What were they giving? I mean, what, what is the Red Cross? Life. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, in fact, we know it's life, don't we? Because you know, you, you, you're, you're giving the gift of life when you give your blood. And so the, the prohibition against drinking blood would, would go back to um, the Lord's, uh, when I taught three or four weeks ago about Christian anthropology, I didn't use those terms. Our understanding of how being made in God's image and life is when I talk about your male and female, two genders, not 56 genders. All that. I don't think I need to tell you all about the truth. It's amazing what you got to teach in 2022, then. But uh, anyway, um, that's the story. The reason I was struck by that is I went on vacation. And um, I mean, it was uh, this man, he says, one of my children's got a transaction. Like, holy smokes, and there's the child, and he's hanging around with other, other transactions. Like 14 years old. What? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, we're, we really need to pray for our, for our world. But anyway, the, the, the reason I mentioned that um, is because I, I knew I needed to talk about that. Nonetheless, I talked about being made in the image and likeness of God after every day of creation, whether it's the stars or the sea or the creatures living within the sea or the animals that roam the earth or all the insects and all that stuff. After every day, God said, he looked upon what he had created, and I love you, gave himself a divine pat on the back. <laughs> he said, this is good. <laughs> yeah. You've know, you got you to admit, it's good. But only when he created us, as human beings, did he say, this is very good. So for a human being to drink an animal's blood is to drink that which is considerably less than, considering we're made in the image and likeness of God, and no other creature is. So to drink an animal's blood is an insult to God. Because you're drinking something which is inferior to yourself. It's like drinking, um, it's like drinking, um, I don't know. I, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I mean, let's not go too ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> but it's inferior. That's one of the reasons why God... Uh, prohibited the drinking of animal blood because one is drinking the life of a s extremely inferior creature. Everything is inferior to us because we're the only creatures made in the image and likeness of God. And I was thinking about that, pardon me for, um, I only have one question. I was thinking about that when I was considering, I, we confirmed 12 people on Sunday at, at, at this mass in Spanish adults that, and not yet been confirmed to receive their sacraments. And I was thinking how beautiful every human being is and how what a miracle we are in, in the face of God, but in the face of each other, right? I mean, this is one of the greatest, the greatest blessings I've made of, as a, of a, among the many blessings of a priest is, it, is to see you. I mean, to look at you. Because I have the best view in the house at Mass. <laughs> Much inferior to you. Look at the stained glass window. Look at the cross. Look at the tabernacle. Otherwise, you never look at this. <laughs> the point is, is that you are beautiful. Everyone's beautiful in God's eyes. Because we're absolutely unique. There's not another one of us like in the world. There's no body like you or you or me. We're, we're it. God, God we made us each in the image and likeness of his divine being. But there's no one like us. And so uh, I just thought about that when I was confirming all those 12 people are beautiful. Each and every one of them is in God's sight. Yes. Yes, Tom. So one of the questions that I have is, 
question that I've had certainly another question. Yes. And, and not one that I've really ever heard um, bad about as far as arguments yes. against that is, um, so what could this mean? And I was wondering if this falls underneath that, is that this man who is standing here in front of us, who is still living, and is telling us that my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And I'm wondering, were they, or could, uh, certainly they could have been thinking, but have you ever heard anyone arguing that they thought that what he meant was that they needed to start actually killing him, eating him right then and there on the spot? Uh, killing him, maybe not. Um, that's a good question, Don. Excellent question. The, the, whether, whether killing him on the spot is what, what some of them even thought would, I, I've never heard that, but that's a great well, question. And that, that thought just popped into my head right now because the, what got me to that point was if you're standing here alive in front of me and you're telling me that my flesh is true, true food and my blood is true drink, like you, like how, what? Well that's, and that's really the. Also going back to the, to the Last Supper because then when he holds up the bread and says, this is my body. Now then it was just the apostles, but, um, but, so, and it seemed to me like there was still some wavering as to whether or not they fully understood that he was God. Well, yes, and, and that's, yeah. that's a very excellent point. The, the fact of the matter is you and I know more about the Eucharist than they did. Because, of course, we have 2,000 years of the church is living this truth. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, the notion of cannibalism is certainly an objection today to the Eucharist. Yes. On the word cannibalism, the preacher in the very first introduction said, wouldn't this be cannibalism, cannibalism? And would it not be that you would be eating him? You would become him? Isn't that the whole idea of communion? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's the, that, and that's really the, that's basically, the, and that's what I teach at every first communion. I say, I always ask the children, what is your favorite food? This was the very first year two children said sushi. <laughs> Jesus better come back. <laughs> but it's bad. It's bad out there. But I mean, yeah. And so I always tell them, you know, if it's sushi, you'll never become a California roll or Philadelphia. You're gonna, if you, but if you eat his body and drink his blood, you will become him. Excellent. And back, so you're saying kind of, your questions are kind of coalescing, your observation and question are kind of coalescing into what does it mean? And of course, within this context of the next seven weeks, we'll have more of an understanding of what Jesus meant for them and for us. But cannibalism is still a uh, stark disagreement or objection to the Holy Eucharist. But <laughs> becoming Christ is certainly the very reason why we eat, eat Christ. Can I pose one more? Of course. So my other question is, if they had the inkling that Jesus is God. Then, as you know, first century Jews, they would know that God's word has power and God's word does things. So, wouldn't it have been more apparent to them than at the Last Supper that when he said, This is my body, that they would understand and know what he meant? Well, they did understand it because the church then began. The church has never ceased to do what Jesus said to do. So they did understand it. They definitely understood it as authoritative because the church has never ceased to celebrate the Eucharist from that point to this. Yes? But I think that we go back to your founding documents, you know, for right. John, and you talk about belief coming first right. and then understanding. 
And I think that there was such a strong belief in him that they went with that. Well, and, and, he did, and he did rise from the dead. Yeah. That, and, and I'm not being facetious no, when I say that. And it was one other thing that I found really, really powerful, and yes. it's from John. But when this first came out, and he was giving, he was giving these objections about why the blood was so abhorrent to them, and he said, and he let them go. Right. You know, he didn't say, come back and let me explain more. Right. You know, let me try to convince you. He's, he let them go. That's right. And that's and a good that's point. Powerful. Yeah, he did let them go. He, he didn't, as, we've, as, as you probably have heard before other writers say, he didn't say, I really meant it was a symbol. If you just listen to me, I, I didn't mean it literally. He didn't say that. He did let them leave, in fact. Excellent. Very good point. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your question, John. And then thank you for your observation. Okay, so the last question to cover, dear ones, is... Uh, what two key Jewish sources must we know in order to understand Jesus' words, this is my body? Who would like to answer that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Found on page uh, 18. 19? 18. Uh, the Jewish, middle of the, towards the bottom of the middle, the Jewish scripture commonly known as uh, the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition enshrined in writings not contained in the Jewish Bible are, are really key sources and, and one thing I'm very excited about is this gentleman, Dr. Petrie, is going to introduce us to um, writings that were Jewish outside of the scriptures that would have formed the people of, of, uh, of Israel, the Jewish people. That, of course, they would have understood not just the Jewish scriptures, but the teachings, okay? The tradition, as it were. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Um, Listen, and we'll keep this one out uh, each week because who knows what else people have going on. But uh, next, please take your study questions. And let's ask the dear Lord as we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.